good. Okay, we move swiftly on for the final presentation of the mid-afternoon session with Jozef Otuchak. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. I know it's uh, kind of late. Uh, so, quick, short introduction about myself. Um, I'm a security professional. I have been interested in music, DIY, creative coding for for a really long time now, I guess, since high school. I wrote my first synthesizer in Turbo Pascal, which, uh, which was pretty basic, but it kind of started me down on the road about uh, synthesizer and music in general. Uh, so the theme of this topic is, uh, and the basic inspiration for this, is that uh, I lived in the US and uh, there I participated in an IoT hacking training and uh, it got me hooked uh, on hardware hacking for some time and IoT hacking. Then, then that kind of died off and I started getting more into hacking synthesizers and how they work. What we're going to cover today is uh, just a short synthesizer history, just so that we are all on the same page about this. Uh, I will cover some interesting synthesizer hacks and the uh, DIY synthesizer scene, like how you can start off, how you can make your own uh, PCBs, where to get projects, stuff like that. So for this presentation, the synthesizer will be like audio synthesizers, video synthesizers, effects, sequencers, development boards and computers. So not just synthesizers uh, in general. And uh, just to get the idea, the synthesizer, it basically generates frequencies internally, like, uh, like based on control voltage or just digital information and whatnot. So it resonates and you send it to a speaker or to an amplifier or whatever. And uh, so this is what it looks like. So you have a control voltage section. Uh, you get like the control voltage from a jack or, or from keyboard or whatever. It doesn't really matter. You get some kind of voltage and you use that to control your oscillators. So the oscillators resonate or generate sound at the frequency based on the control voltage. Uh, and after that, you have like other kind of signal processing, and uh, that kind of differs by synthesizer, so that I wouldn't go into it right now. And at the end of the chain, there is an audio output. So the first synthesizers were mechanical in nature, so they used uh, physical forces like water, wind, uh, stuff like that. It's uh, these weren't really synthesizers in the traditional sense, but one easy to grasp is example, which could be thought of as the precursor of a synthesizer is, uh, you know, those music boxes, which uh, there are pins, combs, and you rotate the, the like cylinder and it kind of like hits those, uh, the, the combs and it resonates at a cer certain frequency and it makes some kind of music. So, uh, that that's one early example of this. Uh, the phonautograph or the phonograph is uh, also kind of like an uh, important thing for this, so that made it possible for audio to get recorded. Uh, people only found out later that you can also play it back. And one of the most interesting synthesizers, in my opinion, is the Telharmonium, which is like a super big uh, electromechanical synthesizer. So it weighed seven tons, it used gears, dynamos, and uh, the funny thing, it broadcasted over telephone. So it was like uh, an early synthesizer plus an IoT device. Uh, the first almost synthesizers, uh, I'm, I guess everyone is kind of familiar with the term. It's like uh, there are two antennas and you control the pitch and the amplitude and uh, you know you make funky out of word sounds with it. Uh, but uh, during the 50s, uh, after World War II, there was a lot of radio and uh, just uh, military test equipment that was dumped on universities, on radios and whatever. So people started experimenting with those and uh, we are talking about like huge vacuum tube driven uh, racks where you could just dial in certain frequencies and stuff like that and people recorded that onto tape and played it back. So they manipulated the tape and uh, that's how they created sounds. And after that, the transistors came. So the circuits became much smaller. We're talking 
going from uh, vacuum tubes to transistors, which were much smaller. So the synthesizers became a thing in the US. Uh, there was the West Coast synthesis uh, driven by Don Buchla. Uh, this was more of a thread, like an experimental version where he thought of the synthesizer as its own instrument category. And Bob Moog and the East Coast synthesis, they just used like pianos and stuff like that. So they used the more traditional classical music type of thing. Uh, so back here, everything was really expensive, hand soldered and made to order. So this was pretty close to the DIY synthesizer scene, just, uh, just in the early days. And after that, we are talking in the 70s, so we are coming up with small integrated circuits. Uh, and arcade machines, game consoles, home computers, they need, needed to make some kind of sound to get that multimedia experience. Uh, so these programmable sound generators were a cheap and easy way to get acceptable sound quality. So you don't, you don't really imagine here like, uh, like something that makes good music. It makes like beeps and uh, zaps and noises. Uh, like the common configuration here is just three voices like square wave, triangle wave, whatever, and the noise channel. So you like pew, pew, psh, and that's it. Like you make sounds with these. And uh, just uh, another uh, programmable sound generator that most people know who have worked with uh, the Commodore 64 is the SID chip. So that SID chip was really good. It's still really good and it's really hard to find. And for a good reason, because it's, uh, it's like almost like a synthesizer in a small package. And after that, uh, integrated circuits became a thing for music. So what this meant is that instead of like having like a circuit board with full of discrete components, you could make the whole thing into just a small chip. Uh, this was much more musical and like specified compared to the programmable sound generators. Uh, this also made mass production possible and polyphony. So you could, before that, you would play a note and you could only play a single note at a time. It would just drift in pitch or, or just cancel the voice. And uh, this gave birth to a bunch of legendary synthesizers that uh, people still love, but uh, the reality about these is just these are built of small building blocks uh, that were created by someone else. So there is nothing really mythical or legendary about them. And after that, uh, the digital renaissance began. So what we have here is that digital technology became affordable. First, we had the first hybrid synthesizers, so where some part of the circuit was digital, then just uh, fully digital synthesizers. So what happened here is that uh, it was possible to save presets. So before that, you had to dial in everything with uh, knobs. And uh, if you wanted to switch a sound, that wasn't possible at all. So what happened here is that you could just push a button and it would restore the preset that you had saved. Uh, one really good example of this digital uh, FM synthesis used with computers and sound cards is the Sound Blaster series. So uh, like they used FM chips to, to make sounds before uh, PCM and playing back uh, PCM uh, like audio data was a thing. Uh, here the Japanese companies dominate the market and uh, this is when analog synths were sold off at the rock bottom prices because people thought that, okay, yeah, digital rocks, let's ditch these analog things. And uh, what also happened is that a lot of US-based companies, they failed because uh, they couldn't keep up with the Japanese. So this is the, this is the time when everything Japanese was pretty awesome. And uh, if you look at 80s action movies, they are saying, oh, the Japanese technology, whatever, that rocks. So the American companies, they didn't really have like CFOs who would, uh, who would look after the business. And uh, they basically, almost all of them got bankrupt. After that, uh, DSP chips finally became affordable. Uh, what it meant is that it was possible for uh, DSP chips to model analog circuits. What ended up happening here is that uh, they managed to recreate some of this, but it lacked character. So those small inaccuracies that analog circuits has, these don't have it, which for some people it's bad, for some people it's good. Uh, 
What's good about this is that polyphony and multi tremulosity was a, a thing. So if you wanted like a lot of noise, like a lot of voices, that's possible. If you want to play different voices at the same time, that's also possible. You just need more DSP computation. The funny thing about this is that emulating these old, old school digital synthesizers, it's now possible because we know how to emulate these DSTP chips now. Uh, like uh, you can run it on your laptop. It's, uh, it's a pretty awesome thing. So what also happened is that computers became fast enough to pre process real-time audio. Uh, what it meant is that uh, it just decreased the barrier of entry. Like uh, before that, you needed expensive circuitry to do this. But here, uh, you could just run a plugin on your, on your machine, run multiple plugins, whatever. Uh, so first, here, like, uh, it, there was a problem where aliasing was, was a problem, but uh, as the processing capabilities become much better, this was eliminated by oversampling. Uh, my problem with these is that focus is mostly on analog emulation, so like recreating these analog synthesizers in the digital domain uh, or creating like these big flagship instruments, which is like not recreatable in real life and like instead of creating instruments. So we have a couple of great free open source synthesizers like the Surge XT or the Vital. Uh, so if you want to look at the source code, it's possible. It's possible to learn from it. So uh, they are really good and check them out if you want. And after that, we have the Eurorack. So the Eurorack is a, is a really cool format. So uh, like back in the day, we had these old like really tall synthesizer racks and people like their fair thought that this is a good thing but let's make it smaller let's make it possible with off-the-shelf components so they popularized this uh, quasi standard it's not really a standard if you ask anyone who is uh, who has doubled into Eurorack it's not a real standard but there are some some like things that people uh, respect in that realm uh, so this is a mixture of analog, mechanical, and digital modules. Uh, this is like how you can imagine this is they're like uh, oscillators, uh, filters, uh, VCAs, whatever. Like everything is like a small module that you can chain and wire together to make your own kind of synthesizer. And there is like a really big DIY community with a lot of open source modules. After that, analog revival. So as I told you, people sold off their analog equipment because that was like bad and they didn't like it anymore. So underground music producers like techno artists, house artists, uh, like Goa artists, like they bought them all. And uh, after that, they kind of became popular and people wanted to get that sound. So cheap classic analog synth prices became like really huge again. And people tried to get these again uh, but they weren't available just for really expensive uh, prices. So what the manufacturers saw that this is like a big gap in the market. So what they tried to do is they re-released those old school synthesizers and uh, sold them off for, for much more. Uh, SMD technology meant that they could have sold it for less, like the, like the component prices were much lower and uh, the tuning was much better and uh, like they could sell it for like affordable prices instead like back in the day they were really expensive the bad thing for me here personally is that there were no innovation there is no innovation so the best thing that they do is just like they plug in uh, some kind of dig digital components so that they can interface with midi but uh, this is just recycling gold gear and selling it again for uh, some better price so nowadays what we have is that DSPs are becoming uh, really, really expensive again because nobody uses them anymore because uh, processing power became really cheap and it's possible to, to calculate real-time audio using microcontrollers and chipsets. Uh, so what happened is that manufacturers switched to ARM-based MCUs. Uh, this meant that uh, there is a much better supply chain, like everybody uses these chips. Uh, there's also a lower barrier of entry, like you can get it for much cheaper. You need to, you don't need to hire like a specified DSP engineer because uh, like the source code is available, it's much easier to program it. 
and uh, but there is a con to it. So these synths are cheaper, but they have less professional features compared to a DSP-based synthesizer. Uh, also, they are running on bare metal or Linux operating systems. So I'm going to talk about some interesting synthesizer hacks. Uh, why you would hack your synthesizer? Well, in certain cases, the original hardware is not supported by the manufacturer anymore. Uh, you, you may want to add new features, uh, change the existing behavior, uh, block telemetry. Uh, that's a thing. Like, if you have a synthesizer, there is like a certain uh, synthesizer brand that broadcasts the, how you use the synthesizer across the internet, which is like really crazy. Uh, you may want to have total control over your device, like you. You want to own it. You don't own it unless you have control over the software. And uh, yeah, hacking stuff is fun. So hardware hacking. So these are made by modifying the circuits. Uh, you add extra functionality to the, to the device, like you add MIDI in or MIDI output to interface with your gear. Uh, you might want to get different responses from analog circuits, so you put on resistors, capacitors, whatever. There are people who are putting uh, things into different chassis. So you have like a small, flimsy uh, plastic synth. You might want to put it into a big metal box so that it's reliable and you can like smash people's head with it. But uh, so this kind of leads to avoiding warranties. So it's not for the faint hearted. There are also custom fervor for devices. So we have, so these are paid replacements, what I'm introducing here. Uh, they have rewritten the operating system from scratch to extend the capabilities. So here we have the sequencer uh, on the top, which uh, kind of makes you able to sequence gear. Like uh, uh, you can control gear in a certain way, some other gear, which was not possible with the original device. It costs like 50 bucks or 50 euros, so it's not, not really that expensive. Uh, we have the GJOS, which kind of replaces the firmware for, for a sampler, and it's like, it's, it makes your device much more powerful. Like, uh, everybody who, is, who uses that device is running on that operating system. So, we have more exciting stuff here. The Korg Electribe, the Electribe sampler as well. So, this is the same hardware, different enclosure. They are exactly the same. Just, they changed some labels, uh, one is black, the other one is gray. Nothing is different from these. Uh, but they didn't let people switch the firmwares because they're greedy as fuck. Uh, but the only protection was just a header check. So pe what people found out is that you rewrite the header, uh, it makes it possible to switch the firmware between the two. Uh, there were some problems with this, but the community now maintains a firmware that combines features of the both uh, operating system. And the uh, funny thing about that is that Quark basically discontinued uh, firmware support for this, so it's now only maintained by the community, which is like really bad because they still sell it. Here we have the Zoom FX pedals. So here we have another example of corporate greed. Uh, Effects are locked to certain device types, which in some cases it makes sense. So there are different kind of models where you have multiple screens and there is like uh, different effects that don't really use those scenes like uh, screens, but you still want to use them on your device. So internally, all of the devices use the same OS and architecture, uh, not the processors because like the ones with the multiple screen are more powerful but you can still upload some effects to cheaper devices. Uh, here's a Python utility that allows you to upload these eff unsupported effects. We also have an example for uh, like building up uh, on the original firmware. So here we have the Volca sample and Volca FM. So one of them is a sampler, sample player. And the other is a, an FM synthesizer. Uh, so Pajin or Pajan, or I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, they added a lot of additional features uh, to, these, uh, to these synthesizers, which meant that uh, your device is much, power, much more powerful than it was earlier. Uh, this was only available for V1 devices, so Quark released a version two, but uh, they didn't say like, okay, we're gonna help this guy out or girl out. 
uh, they just released a new firmware and uh, they didn't really port those features. So if you buy the V2, it might not have all the features that your hacked firmware one has. So yeah, corporate greed. Here we have uh, Hackai or MPC Live Explorer. Uh, so what we have here is that there are several MPC devices, but they are, what happens here is that uh, these are running Linux and uh, these were locked down, but uh, people managed to root these devices. So now you can SSH in uh, VNC, like control over VNC. Uh, what happened here is that uh, people reverse engineered the firmware and they found unreleased uh, hardware revisions. And so people got a heads up that their uh, device is gonna be like pretty much obsolete in a, obsolete in a few months. So another exciting hack about this is that they had a different device which wasn't really compatible with this one, but they managed to execute uh, the software from that device, which is really cool. Like you buy one and you can run the operating system from the other one. And uh, this was just released two days ago. Uh, this is uh, a synthesizer that has a new modular design and it, it uses the Intel Nuke computer element, uh, compute element. Uh, what it means that you can replace uh, the CPU and like the, the motherboard of your synthesizer. So what they're hoping for here is that uh, it's more sustainable and has a longer product life cycle uh, and it also runs Linux. Uh, the thing here is that they are using an older generation, so uh, support is going to end uh, for that compute element next year. So uh, yeah, don't buy this one yet. Okay, uh, the DIY scene scheme. So as I said, the early synthesizers were almost DIY in nature, like people soldered it together in their garages or in their like apartments and stuff like that. But uh, DIY couldn't keep up in the 80s, 90s. There, it, like the chips were expensive or they couldn't even get chips. So that kind of died off. Like there were some old engineers who were making synthesizers, but this wasn't really a thing with, with younger generations. So when Arduino became a thing and Web 2.0 became a thing, the DIY electronics scene got kind of revived. Uh, like people found out that, um, okay, you can share tutorials, you can get more information. And uh, like people wanted to get back the sound of the old uh, video consoles that they used. So they started uh, taking out the PSGs and the FM chips from old consoles. Like uh, here's one example, the Electron SID station. <laughs> so what they do did here is that they got the SID chips from Commodore 64s and they put it into a shiny box and they sold it. Uh, now this is really expensive because you can't really get uh, SID chips anymore, uh, but there are alternatives based on FPGAs and uh, just software emulations in general. So the other thing that happened here is microcontrollers became good enough for synthesis. Uh, so you could get an Arduino and make some really, really low-fi sounds with it. And uh, thanks to Chinese FP, F, like PCB fabricators, you can also create your PCBs like without like suffering with a strip board or just uh, like using acid to etch your PCBs. And uh, like the digital synths kind of look like IoT devices from a certain perspective. Like uh, you have sensors, you get analog control signals or digital control signals from those. You do some kind of uh, processing, you interface with the storage, the hardware, or the network, and uh, you forward digital data to MIDI, or you forward uh, digital data to the digital analog converter, and from that you get the audio, and uh, the synthesizer plays some wonderful tunes. Uh, so these can, this can be done with off-the-shelf components, like you can order your stuff, there are kits here, like, uh, you can do whatever you want. And uh, what you need to like really take care here, what you need to do here is just interface with the external signals and send some signals externally again. So everything else is code. So I love code, uh, you should too. Uh, 
you can basically do whatever you want with these. Whereas with analog synthesizers, you have to just make a circuit, and if you want to modify that, that's more pain in the ass. So some like really good uh, companies that uh, kind of made this whole thing possible, uh, Mutable Instruments. So they are the original hardware, open hardware synth company by Emily Gillette. Uh, so all of her designs were eventually open sourced, so you can find whatever she made, you can find it online. Uh, she's also, well, she has been really active on forums before that, uh, but she, she shut down her company because uh, uh, just manufacturers were cloning her uh, modules and synthesizers left and right without like paying back, which is okay because uh, the license allowed that, but it, uh, she, sort of got rid of the whole thing because she didn't like giving support for free. So uh, she shared a lot of knowledge about circuitry and DSP design. Uh, her code is still used by large manufacturers like Behringer or Arturia, and uh, they often lie about uh, their contributions to the DSP uh, community. Uh, so, but it's still something to check out if you're interested. So. The other one is the Mono Norns. Uh, these, these are made by a small US-based artist collective who are creating unique synthesizers and controllers. Uh, they have a lot of open source design and open hardware projects. Not everything is open source, not everything is open hardware, but some are. Uh, this is community driven. There's the Norns shield right here. Uh, this runs on a Raspberry Pi. It's open source hardware, so you can make your own. And uh, you can use Super Collider and Lua to create your own synths or effects or whatever you want. The other one is Critter and Guitari. They have the Organel and the IZ. Uh, this is also a US-based boutique synth manufacturer. They also use the Raspberry Pi uh, computer module. Uh, they, are running I they are running Linux, Python, or whatever. Like the users publish and modify changes, hacks, uh, it, they really expanded on the whole uh, ecosystem, so you can basically uh, create your own synthesizers using pure data, which is uh, also an open source but graphic programming language for interacting with audio. And if, if you want to learn more about uh, synthesizers and uh, DIY hacking, you, you can check out electromusic.com or Modwiggler. Uh, but be careful, these are OG forums. There is like uh, data going back from for a really long time. Old topics might be outdated and they are not really keen to newbies. So they expect you to read a lot, so RTFM. Uh, but the Lions community, I personally find it much better. It's not that about hardware, it's more about DSP projects and uh, audio in general. Uh, if you look for open source synth projects, you can find a lot on uh, GitHub. So they publish PCBs, uh, they publish write-ups, they publish uh, BOMs, so not BOMs, B-O-Ms, Build of Materials. So you can get them there uh, and you can order it from your local friendly hardware electronics supplier. Also, if you're located in Budapest, uh, the e ASS or S, uh, they offer local workshops uh, a couple of times a year, like every couple months, and they do it for really cheap. So it's really affordable. Uh, you should participate if you want. Uh, these are really small but really enthusiastic people, so shout out to them. And if you're more of a visual type, uh, here are a couple of YouTube channels. So Hagivo makes uh, really affordable modular synthesizers, uh, like modular synthesizer modules, if you look at that. Uh, so they rely very much on Arduino, so you know it's like a couple of bucks. Like the most expensive uh, module that I have seen is like 20 bucks. So it's really good, really cheap. Uh, Moritz Klein, SynthDI guy, and Look Mom No Computer, they also make. Uh, so these have like different learning curves, but all of them are really good. And that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I'm available on Discord if you want to ask questions as well. well ladies and gentlemen, just before we, we say thanks to Jozef, we, we are ahead of uh, time. So are there any uh, questions?
There's one. Are you going to ask it or yes, yes, sing it? You could sing it. <laughs> so how many L's are in the L uh, lines um, at the end? It, it was hard to count. Sorry? How many L's are in the last uh, LLLLL.com? Eight, I guess. Thank you. Eight or seven. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but you can check it out on, on the slides. Thank you. Any, anything from anybody else? Okay, in which case, Jozef, thank you very much.